in verse 9, he said, How is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements? The word how is like, how is it possible? So the Greek idea is that Paul was literally sitting there trying to figure out how such a thing happened. He was full of wonder. Like, how did this, I don't understand. Why would they want to go back? to something that cannot produce Christ in you, the expectation of glory. Why are they wanting to go back to things that are so inferior? Remember, we've learned that he not only taught them the, the legalists would come, he told them who they were by name. They watched him confront Peter, who was living like a Gentile until the Jews came into town. I mean, he made it so plain. He was shocked at how they could even think it was an idea. And I think we've all seen that, where you see people that followed God with their whole heart, they were doing you know, all kinds of crazy, wonderful things, and then they would turn back to their old way of life. Again, it goes back to knowing where the enemy will try to take advantage of you. In the mirror in 4.9, it says, In the meantime, you've come to know the real God. What is most significant, however, is to discover that he knew you all along, after all, how could you possibly feel attracted again to the pathetic principles of religious deception? It does not matter in what disguise legalism comes, whether pagan or Jewish, it brings the same bondage. Wow. There you go. Yeah, that sums it up. So, uh, again, I personally believe, and I don't know if Paul tied it together, but again, I think it is that orphan mentality. You know, it's anywhere you think you need to perform, anywhere you think you're not measuring up, that is what is going on. It makes you susceptible to rules and regulations. Okay, now listen to this. I'm quoting this from the Weist Work Studies from the Greek. And this is from a great commentator. He's one that I actually like most of what he has to say. A lot of commentators, I'm like, because they, you know, are you're still a sinner and women suck and all that stuff. But life, it was pretty good. It is clear, however, from the context that the Apostle is not speaking of the Jewish race alone, but of the heathen world also before Christ, not of the Mosaic law only, but of all forms of law, which might be subservient to the same purpose. This appears from him including his Galatian hearers under the same tutelage. Nor is this fact to be explained by supposing them to have passed through a stage of Jewish proselytism or proselytism, uh, on their way to Christianity, St. Paul distinctly refers to their previous idolatrous worship and no less distinctly and emphatically does he describe their adoption of Jewish ritualism as a return to the weak and beggarly discipline of childhood from which they had been emancipated when they abandoned pagan worship. So, the law is a clear no. Following the law, no. Following paganism, no. All of that stuff, astrological signs, psychic stuff, uh, you know, observing all these different things, it's all lumped in the same thing. Oh, well, what about Sunday? Is that when you should have church? Not necessarily. You can have church every day in your living room. You can have church every day at work. We are the church. You don't go to yourself. You go, you know, wherever you're at, two or three. Remember, is it a, a, a Roman uh, consortium where... You are gathered together. I am there in the midst. Now, did they gather together on Sunday simply? Yeah, they did because it was convenient. So, even Sunday is not a law. So, some have raised the idea that maybe the Judaizers brought on observing days, months, time, and years because those were the least repulsive to the Gentiles from the Mosaic Law. And then eventually they'd get them to adopt circumcision. For the Gentiles, circumcising was considered a vulgar, distasteful practice. They didn't like it. However, they could throw a baby on a rock to die. You know what I mean? I mean, it's crazy. So, they, it seems like the legalists were trying to find common ground with their pagan worship and then bringing it in. And the same thing happened with Constantine. When Constantine legalized Christianity, they turned pagan temples into churches and they turned pagan holidays into Christian holidays. See? So that's why there was such a mixture 
when it came to the faith of uh, some of the Christians and the believers, for some of them, they just tacked Jesus onto what they already did because it appeared to be the same. And out of that actually came the Catholic Church. And you know, okay. I think, don't you think that's part of what they say a little leaven spoils the whole thing? Oh, absolutely. A, a, a few of those little got tos uh, it really spoils of the relationship that God intends for us in the same way with the the new wine and the old wine skin. Mm -hmm. You know? Tells yep. you you can't do it. Well and even the whole priestly office that came from uh, the law. And and so what's very you know, because they had well, and not just the law but also paganism. Because you had priests and priestesses, right? And so you had all of that. And in fact, it was Constantine legalizing Christianity where Christians were no longer persecuted for their faith. And then the government poured a lot of money into the church. So what happened is a lot of priests that became priests were not even born again. Because it was very profitable monetarily to become a priest. They would then sell indulgences. What the heck are indulgences? Do you know? Anybody? I always thought it was kind of where you basically could do certain things as long as you paid. For up forgiveness? Front. Yeah. Up front? You yeah. had to pay for your you had to pay up front to keep your relatives that have died out of purgatory. Ah. Yeah, because usually you pay a mass for them. Okay. So we're lifted up. So we're trying to get them into heaven. They tried to get them out of purgatory in the heaven. Okay, so let me make sure I understand. Because I wasn't raised in religion. So you're telling me that indulgences were fees you paid somebody so that your loved one could be purchased out of purgatory, right. which doesn't exist, by the way, to go to heaven. Right. So the blood of Jesus didn't do that and faith in Him. You could pay for someone. Yeah, you could pay your way out. Or their way out. Well, anywho, praise the Lord. So, what happened is, then they started, all the services were in Latin. See, stuff like this happens today. All the services were in Latin, and the Bible was literally chained, literally, to the podium. It was illegal to have a Bible, because religion always seeks to keep you immature. So, Tyndale, I think Tyndale was martyred, if I'm not mistaken. Well, One of the greats was martyred. The Gutenberg that invented the printing press, because the first thing I think they printed was the Bible. Yes. And I think he was persecuted anyway. Well, if, all if of them were martyred. persecuted yes. that brought us the Bible, but one of them died, and I'm pretty sure it was Tyndale. We'd have to look it, look well, it up. I, but the purpose is the enemy always seeks to take the word away from you. Mm -hmm. Never let him do that by what anybody says or what anybody does. See, the Word is a person, but it's also written. And offense can steal the Word from you. Pride can steal the Word from you. It's anything that can deafen you to what the Word is saying because He is a person. And so whenever you open the Word, especially the New Testament, you're getting an impartation of the person of Jesus Christ because He is life and He is spirit. The words I speak to you are life and their spirit. So the enemy always seeks to take away the word. And then, if you look over here, uh, this scripture just came to my mind. In 1 Timothy, chapter 3. Nope. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. Verse 1. And I don't know what it says in the Passion. If it's really good, let me know. Uh, but 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Now that word perilous means mentally fatiguing. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haunty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Okay, and like I've said many, many times, 
you could look at that and say, oh, yes, that's the world. I mean, if you look on the news, we've got, you know, this and that, and people doing this and saying that, and blah, blah, blah. So you might think that Paul is referring to sinners. But sinners have always been unforgiving, slanders, without salvation, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. We were the same thing. Then he says something very interesting in verse 5. Having a form of godliness, mm. but denying mm. its power from such people turn away. He's referring to people that uh, follow forms of religious ritual. Right. The mirror says their make-believe devotion. Mm-hmm. What does the passion say on verse 5? They may pretend to have a respect for God, but in reality they want nothing to do with God's power. Stay away from people like these. Yeah, so they have a form of godliness. You can meet them, praise the Lord, shake their hand, how's it going, good, call each other brother and sister, all of that stuff, because they have a religious mindset when it comes to worshiping God, but when it comes to allowing the power of God to come in and do transformation, they don't allow it. So they're hidden. They're hidden lovers of themselves, lovers of money, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But according to Malachi 3.15, there's coming a time where it's also, there's going to be a separation where we will once again know who is righteous right. and who is unrighteous. But this is very interesting that Paul says this. Keep reading. Because then he says in verse 6, For of this sort are those who creep into households, and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janice and, I always want to say hombres, <laughs> Jembrace, <laughs> resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning a faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. Janice and, I'm just going to call them homebrae, they were priests of the pagan religious system with Pharaoh. Whenever Moses confronted the system and did signs and wonders, they did their own signs and wonders. So again, he is tying together the law and paganism okay so again let me reiterate in case someone's just now coming into the teaching the law in itself delivered to Moses by angels was not evil but in light of the work of Jesus Christ to go back to following the law is just the same as going back and following pagan worship according to the word of God this morning okay now let's finish up in verse 11 in the Passion, now this, what is also crazy, is that Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, and he's writing this. I mean, you know, that, that should say a lot. Okay, so in verse 11, I'm so alarmed about you that I'm beginning to wonder if my labor and ministry among you was a waste of time. So the construction of the Greek is that Paul isn't that Paul fears this might happen to the Galatians in the future. When he wrote that, he already suspected that he had lost them already. He was afraid he'd already lost them. And uh, the word labor means to labor to the point of exhaustion. The tense suggests that Paul had done such a thorough work among the Galatians that it was complete. That's why he was looking to go to Spain. It was already complete, but now the legalists were coming in and they were threatening that work. And then verse 12, he says, Beloved ones, I plead with you, follow my example and become free from the bondage of religion. So let me just make this plain. If Paul was alive today, he would not be wearing a zit zit or whatever that is. He'd be eating some bacon with us. He would be, you know, going into houses of Gentiles. He, he wouldn't be doing all... In fact, not only would he do that, he probably would have a few things to say to some of the congregations that tell their people they have to do that stuff. He would be their biggest opponent. Okay? So he is saying, follow my example. 
if I, as a Pharisee of Pharisees, could become free from following the law, you should also. I once became as one of you, a Gentile, when I lived among you, now become free like me. When I first came to minister to you, you did me no wrong. I can't believe you would do me wrong now. Now what I find very interesting is Paul is not only appealing to the relationship to God, but he's also appearing to the relationship to him. In other words, their defection he is taking personally. It's not just a rejection of the word of God. It's not just a rejection of Jesus Christ. It's a rejection of him as a person. Okay? So this is crucial. Especially because legalists have infiltrated the church even to this day. Paul is saying, because as I am, because I became as you are. In other words, I am free from the bondage of law, therefore you need to be free. He ate unclean meat. He did not follow the ceremonial cleansing and rituals, etc., etc. Absolutely nothing. He lived among them as a Gentile because he thoroughly understood his freedom in Christ. Why is this crucial? Because legalists today will tell you that some of the law and the observances filtered through the cross today. They'll say, well, Jesus did them, so we should. Well, of course Jesus did them because he came to fulfill every jot and tittle of the law and then he took the punishment we deserve as well. So, of course Jesus fulfilled the law. It, not all of it, though. He ticked off the Pharisees all the time because they added stuff. Okay, so then they'll also tell you, well, Paul instructed us to keep some of the law. No, actually, according to this, he said he didn't. You see what I mean? We've got to know this stuff. Because people, they will argue until they are blue in the face that we're supposed to keep certain aspects of the law. So, he didn't, and he confronted Peter to his face when he did. So it's important to note that we did see times that he interacted as a Jew in the book of Acts. For example, sponsoring the Jewish men who had taken a Nazarite vow. He also had Timothy circumcised. Why? So he could gain influence to minister and not offend his national brethren. He would do it. But guess what? It never worked. Because anytime they saw Paul doing anything in the temple, it caused a riot. Why? Because of what he taught here. Okay? They knew he was teaching against Moses' law. They knew what he was doing. Actually, he wasn't teaching against the law. He was teaching against observing it. I personally believe that Paul was also on a journey as he went through figuring this whole thing out. But what we do know is that by the time of this letter, returning to any law, whether Moses or pagan, was returning to bondage, and he, uh, he pled with them not to abandon him. I mean, he took it personally. They were going to be abandoning him. And then, of course, not only on that, but and the reason he took it personal is they saw the Jews run him from Pisidian Antioch. They saw the Jews run him from uh, Derby. He was actually killed outside the gates of Derby. They saw uh, them run him out of Lystra and or Lystra. And so these same people that ran their beloved apostle out of these cities, they were listening to. That's why he took it personal because they saw the struggle he went through. He probably even cried in front of them, guys. Because I could tell you one thing with Paul. He, he even said, it sounds like I know him, but he even <laughs> said, I would give up my salvation if Israel could be saved. He said that. That's how much he loved his Jewish brethren. But he also, on the other side, was not going to put up with any legalists messing with Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ crucified. That right there was, you know, his, his line in the sand, I guess you would say. I, I mean, I'm sure that you guys, I'm preaching to the choir, but if you have anybody that feels they have to keep the law, I want you to be equipped. You know what I mean? I want you to have these verses here to where you can read to them and you can show them the extent to which Paul went to to make it very, very plain in this book. You know what I mean? And then, I also want you guys to be equipped where if you see any part of you that feels a need to perform in order to be accepted, and not just accepted by God, if you feel any need to perform to be accepted by us, something's wrong. 
You know what I mean? You should not have to perform to be accepted by me, to be accepted by Kathy, to be accepted by Gigi. None of us. There should be no performance in any of our relationships whatsoever. Because we don't know one another after the flesh. We know one another after the spirit. And we should see one another according to how heaven sees us. Right? right? So, we're probably almost done with this series. Have you guys seen or felt any change in how you see yourself and how you see your interaction with Father? Well, I've noticed that if I start to think I need to, as far as pray, read, yeah. I need to, then sometimes I just don't do it out of spite. <laughs> because it's like, no, I don't need to do that. <laughs> I'll just go to bed. Yeah. You know? Uh, and, uh, so, uh, yeah. but I have noticed that it's like, okay, it's like a retraining, though, of my brain. Right. So I think sometimes it's like, you know, it's almost like a stand. No, I don't need to do that. I, I will choose, I will to, choose do to do it because I love him. Exactly. Yes. I mean, that's the, the main thing. I mean, how, if Mike came home and he said, well, wife, it's five o'clock. I need to have coffee with you. That's what we do every day. I'd be like, you know what? You, you and your coffee can go somewhere else. I'll have, you know, I'm going to have coffee with people I want to have coffee with. But no, Whoa. it's a desire for us to have our coffee every day. So that's, that's the thing. I mean, how does it make God feel that we are feel obligated to do things with Him? Yeah. Anybody else? Have you noticed any thought patterns or things? Um, well, yeah, because I've always been a people pleaser. So, you know, uh, or, you know, always self-esteem issues and stuff. So, yeah. You no, know, you don't need to, you don't need to do that. Because you, know, you get those thoughts. Right. And uh, I don't accept that. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. the law is always here to tell you what's wrong with you. Oh, yeah. Have y'all noticed that? It's, it's never here to tell you what's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And then what's also good and what we've learned is that the blood of Jesus, Jesus came not only to set us free, but he also came to cleanse our conscience from guilt. So that's where you don't live out of need tos. Mm -hmm. You don't live out of obligations, and if you don't do it, you feel guilty. Your relationship with Jesus Christ and Father is not gauged by what you do or don't do. It is always gauged by your faith right. in Him. Therefore, if I make a mistake, I don't have to feel guilt. But what does guilt's purpose have? The conviction of the Spirit is to alert you that you did something that offended love. Okay, so it's never that you offended a law, it's that you offended love. He didn't like that, so he wants you to go ahead and get that right. Okay, so there is a purpose for conviction. Anybody else have anything before we pray? Okay, I got a good one. <laughs> what would you feel like if Holy Spirit told you, okay, do you feel an obligation to come on church on Sundays. Not anymore. Used to? Yep. Yeah. A lot of people, they would feel guilty if they didn't go to church. You know what I mean? And so, on the other side of it, it's like, well, you don't, you know, you want to get together with Christians, you know. But mm -hmm. there's, Holy Spirit may have a different thing for you Absolutely. that Saturday. We've seen, that, yeah. We've seen it here with Marsh and Holly. Yeah. You know, and they uh, were going to come and Holy Spirit's like, no, you don't need to. They met some friends, had an awesome prophetic word that not just impacted us, but it impacted the state of New Mexico. God, through that couple, delivered a prophetic message that went right along with everything yeah. we had been discussing and talking about. So, yeah, it's be led. Be led. Yeah. Always be led. Never out of guilt or obligation, but always be led. Yeah. All right, well, let's pray. So, Father, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ, that he has freed us from the slave market of legalism. Father, we ask that you continue to set us free and show us any of those areas where obligation, guilt, performance, man-pleasing, all of that stuff is still trying to be the source of our life and decisions. And, Father, we set our hearts on knowing one thing, 
and that is Jesus Christ and Him crucified and the love that propelled Him to do such a thing. We celebrate that Jesus Christ fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law. He did not break a single mandate. He didn't break a single aspect or even intention of the law. Not only did He not do that, but then He also took the punishment and the guilt that should have been on us he took it on himself to set us free so that you father could fulfill your desire and that was to impart to us your righteousness so right now in unity and faith we decree we are righteous we are holy we are victorious we are peace we are joy we live from these places not toward it we are not subject to any man-made uh, rule or obligation, nor are we subject to the Mosaic Law. We have been born again and set free because we now have a new nature that is capable of loving you with our entire being and loving our neighbor as ourself. And so, Father, we pray that if there's any area in us that does not love ourselves, then we pray, Father, that you highlight that to us show that to us and help us transform that thinking we give you honor and what you're doing in our city and in our uh, our people and in our our group father and now we want to give to you not out of obligation or guilt our tithes and offerings and father we know that you are the source and the origin you are the god there is no other gods there is no other uh, being that trumps you. You are the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. And we happily give to you our money. And so, Father, we pray that you take this, you use it as you will, and that Jesus Christ accepts it on his throne. We ask, Father, for the windows of heaven to be opened. I rebuke the devourer in, for everybody in this room. I rebuke the devourer in Jesus' name. You can no longer eat the seed. And... Father, I pray that a harvest begin to be produced in the lives of everybody in this room that is beyond um, uh, explanation. And Father, I also ask that as we sow into the working believer's life this morning, Father, as we sow into that person's life, that the harvest be returned to us so that we can do even more sowing. And Father, I pray that you startle us with your goodness over this next week. We give you honor. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are going to give our working believer offering to that lady. And um, so does she already have it in the uh, garage? Or yes. Okay. Do I make it out to the garage? No, because I don't know what any of the details on it. Okay. She had had a hard time even, this is like the third or fourth time she's went to get the same problem fixed. And it was always like, oh, we think it's this. Oh, we think it's that. You know, and I think they finally pinpointed what it is. So. Okay. But, you know, she's gone through three mechanics trying to figure that out. And she's kind of used her resources up, you know. Okay. So. But you trust her to mm -hmm. oh, yes. take it to the mechanic. To use money for that. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure. Yeah. Yeah, she's been trying to do garage sales and everything else to raise the money for that. So. Okay. That's what it's for. So who do I make it out to? Go ahead and just make it out to her. What's your name? Frankie Scofield. S C O F I E L D. You know what I really liked about this verse about today? Hmm. That was that one verse about how when you explained that the Mosaic and the pagan law were all considered uh, considered a fall from grace. Yeah. Well, if you're